So I'm going to talk about strategies for investigating mysteries, and that's what I do. My, my job title is Chief Investigator for the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, and basically my job is eight hours, ten hours a day, I get to investigate weird shit, and I love it. I absolutely love my job, and I'm going to share some of the information that I've learned over the years with you guys. Um, one of the goals of this presentation, especially this presentation, is because we're doing these skeptic camps around the country, and I want to help share the information that I have, my methodology, tips and tricks and everything with you guys so that when, you, when, when Halloween comes around and you see the news do all these fluff pieces about ghost hunters in the most haunted place in the world, which happens to be in every state that runs a news program, <laughs> um, that instead of just contacting the local ghost hunting group, they can contact you guys. Um, and for me, it helps with my job because I want to be able to say, hey, you know what? I know someone in West Virginia. I know someone in Raleigh, North Carolina. I know someone in Utah. That these are groups that I've worked with, that I've interacted with, that have taken the workshops that I've done, that we're on the same page. So if I get a call that, that there's a news crew that wants to do a haunted house or a UFO sighting or a Bigfoot sighting in any of these places, I can say, you know what? I'm really interested, but I just can't do it because I can't either fit it in my budget or I don't, uh, I don't have the time on my schedule. But I do have a group that I do trust completely, and you can contact them, and you guys can go out and check it out. Plus, it's cool. It builds that relationships with the community because it's not just the ghost hunting community gets out there because they're all friendly and shit. <laughs> you guys can get out there and be friendly and shit um, <laughs> and, and, and be part of that. So what is a mystery? A mystery is basically an unsolved question, and it's usually followed by us trying to figure out what it is. You know, this is a secret. This is something unknown, and we're trying to figure it out. So I have a mystery for you guys. It's not going to be a big test, but this middle picture is a ghost that we captured at the uh, house that many of the speakers are staying at. We captured this this weekend, so you can take a look at it as long as it's on screen and see if you can figure out what that thing is. And then afterwards, we'll talk about it, after my talk, because I have a lot to talk about in a very short amount of time, so I'm going to keep going, and I'm going to talk really fast. But if you see it, it's this blurry shape that's in the middle that you can see is causing a shadow on the wall and on the floor, which is pretty cool, huh? Pretty cool. All right. So this poster, uh, I, I created this, and I update this every so many months or years, depending on how I'm doing, how I'm working. This hangs up in my office above my computer so that when I'm working on a mystery and I get stuck, I literally sit back in my chair, because I can, and look up at the wall and think, what haven't I done? So feel free to take a, take a picture of this if you want to. I don't have copies of this, but basically everything you see here are on the sheets that I gave out. So you have it there with a summary of each one to tell you what it's about and how I, kind of how I use it. Um, so I'll give you a moment, take pictures there. And now I'm going to go through some of the, the steps here. I'm not going to go through all of them because that's way too long. That's like a three-hour workshop to go through each one of them. But I'm going to go through a few of them that are important, that I think are really important. You got it? Good? Okay. Make sure. Oh, did you get it? You got it? Okay. Asking questions. This is by far the most important thing that you can do on any investigation. This is the basis. This is the foundation, the concrete foundation of an investigation is asking questions because this is how we obtain information. This is how we ex expand our knowledge. This is how we understand what's going on. It is the who, what, when, where, how, and why of a mystery. So you have to ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Most, some people that I deal with are a little hesitant. They don't want that confrontation. And I say, embrace it. <laughs> like, just own that, because you want to know. I guarantee if you don't ask a question, there is a 100% chance you will not get an answer. <laughs> All right, so ask a question. And on that note, ask clarifying questions. All right, you have to get more detail because most people, like one of the most common descriptions of a ghost that I get is I saw a ghost wearing Victorian clothing. What the hell does that mean? Like, I get it, there's a period in, in our history where there was a certain social fashion ac aspect, but is it upper class, lower class? Is it worn? Is it brand new? Is it royalty? What are we talking here, about here? You know, I need more details. So you have to ask clarifying questions. Um, there's two types. There's open questions, 
where you ask someone to elaborate on something that they've mentioned. So if, I've, if I said something about, yeah, people have said that they see ghosts in Victorian clothing. You might ask me later on, can you elaborate? Like, what other kinds of things do people talk about? You know, what other vague questions do they ask you? And then you have validation questions. Is basically, it's if a speaker or someone you're talking to says something and you're not exactly sure what they mean, or if they really said that, you know, like, did you say what I think you said? You asked to clarify. For an example, uh, there was a gentleman I was on a, a discussion panel with, and that's as far as I'm going to say about that, because it was ghost hunters and me. Uh, and the one ghost hunter said that he was involved with a case of a haunted house where the U.S. military was investigating this haunted house. I'm glad I'm seeing some confused looks on your face, because it was not true at all. Um, he said this to a Boy Scout troop. So we had a room bigger than this, filled with Boy Scouts, and he was telling them this story about the U.S. military, they're investigating this and everything, and when he finally shut up, uh, I, <laughs> I'm sorry, it was so annoying to listen to him talk, um, but when he finally stopped talking, I, they wanted to move on to the next topic, and I said, wait, 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 wait. Did you say that the U.S. military was investigating a haunted house? And he's like, yes. I was like, all right. Did you mean that the actual U.S. military was investigating it like a government-sanctioned investigation, or was it retired military personnel that got together for a social group of ghost hunters and went to this house? And he was like, yeah, the second one. <laughs> I was like, okay, you should really clarify when you're talking to the kids, you know, because you just deceived them, all right? So moving on, um, speak with the locals. This is so overlooked. Um, there's so many times you could save yourself a lot of time and work by just speaking with the locals, either a local resident or a local employee, uh, because they know like the local haunts, so to speak. They know the local eateries. They know the mom and pop shops. They know the local legends um, or slang terms. Like for me, I'm from Philly. We say water ice. So anybody hear that before? Instead of water ice, it's, we, we just say water, water ice. It's just a Philly accent. Yo. Yo, don't start. <laughs> we have words outside. <laughs> what are I? But they also, not only do they know the local legends, but they usually know the original story that spawned that local legend. So talk to them. Um, take time to chat with neighbors and employees and residents and other stuff. Um, for an example of this, I went to a place called Fort Niagara, and it's in Niagara, New York. Uh, I live in Buffalo now, so it was a few minutes away. I went there. And I toured the whole fort, I went to the gift shop. I'm excited, I'm like, where are the ghost story books? Because every fort is haunted. It's just, that's the standard procedure. Everything's haunted. Nothing, not a book, nothing at all. The cashier says, oh, we do have this. And it's a postcard. And it talks about, and every month on the full moon, the headless Frenchman leaves the well to search for his missing head. I'm like, cool, <laughs> this is really cool. Reminded me of Eric. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is disgusting. This is, <laughs> the story gets better. Um, I'm going to give you a, con <laughs> I'm going to give you a condensed version. Basically, two guys during the French occupation, uh, they were at a party. They got drunk. Um, they had a fight over a girl. Um, they decided to have a duel because that's what they did. Uh, one killed the other <laughs> by mistake and then said, oh, shit. <laughs> what do I do now? Because he's literally downstairs. This well is the, the ground floor of the building, and two floors up, that's where the party was. So, of course, instead of just dumping the body in the well or dragging it outside, he decides to cut the body up into pieces and then run out to Lake Ontario and throw it in the lake. Um, when he decapitates the person and runs out with the head and then finally comes back, he realizes this is taking too long. So he dumps the body in the well. And there's the story. So now um, we have internet stories and books in the area describing this. The TV show Ghost Hunters were there at the well investigating this. And I'm thinking, this is great. You know what? This is good for the Western New York branch of CFI. We can get a field trip together. We can go out there on the night of the full moon and sit there and wait for nothing to happen. <laughs> so I contacted the fort. I send, that, I send them an email saying, hey, this is who I am. This is what I'd like to do. How can I arrange this? 
you know, it would be really great. Well, we'll take all the expense. We just want to come out and just wait literally for nothing to happen um, just so we can say we did it. So they reply to me, thanks. This story was invented in the 1920s to encourage people to visit the fort. <laughs> Completely fabricated story. So all of these stories that were on the Internet and in books and everything, all false, all based on a story that was made up in the 1920s to sell tickets. There is absolutely no information that it actually happened during the French occupation. There's no records, nothing at all. So speaking with the local employee saved me a lot of time and trouble. I mean, I still really would have liked to do it because I, I like that kind of stuff. I would have sat there for hours doing nothing just to say, yeah, I did it. There ain't nothing there. Uh, but that, that, it was a bummer, but okay, it saved me time. Who are they? This is a big deal, knowing who they are. How many times have you been in a conversation when you hear the phrase, well, they say? I mean, yeah, like, who the hell is they? Tell me who they are, because, I mean, that's, we're skeptics. That's who we, what we ask, right? So to me, in my line of work, there are two, time, two types of they. There are the unknown experts that really don't help anything, but people use them as proof. And we usually have something like this, a scenario that happens hundreds of times to me, that they present me with a photograph or a video of an alleged ghost or a UFO or something like that, and I say, well, I give them the explanation from my point of view, and then they come back and say, well, I had a couple of photographers look at it, and they said it's legit. They said it's authentic. I'm like, all right, what are their names? That's when the problem comes in, because now it's like, well, they don't want anyone knowing that they're associated with this, and they want to keep out of it. I'm like, all right, well, then I'm going to keep all of your story out of it, too, because it's useless. It's useless to me. Um, and then you have the other type of they are the people that are in it for money, for attention, for a book deal, for a movie deal. They're on TV already, and they want to stay on TV, so they want ratings. They want a paycheck, a big old pay. This doesn't work on there. That sucks. Um, but I encounter those people all the time, um, and they're always re referred to as experts, even though they're not experts. It's kind of like saying that the, the guy that makes the fries at McDonald's is a weekend ghost hunter, and now he's an expert on the spirit world. Uh, it doesn't make sense. Google it. Google, this is basically a blanket term um, for those of us old enough uh, for Xerox. Like you'd have, oh, I need a Xerox copy. Everybody knew what that meant. Um, but now we have Google. So Google basically means to look it up, to start researching it, to figure out what's going on. All of these here that you see on screen are tools that I use. Feel free to take a picture of it. These are just some of the tools that I use. Uh, Google, of course, is great. All of the, the Google Earth images, uh, maps, they all help me. Social media helps me research people. Um, Susan, like you know you know well that you can look up people's information. Dead loved ones, where they've been, what they've done over their lives. You can go back years and find out all this information. Um, and it, it's, so, it's so easy to do, yet it feels like people don't realize how not private you are. So using tools like this, Truthfinder, Been Verified, these are background checkers that I use in order to get backgrounds on anyone. Um, so when I'm visiting someone or if I'm working with somebody and I don't know them, I do a background check because I want to know who I'm dealing with. Uh, and I'm going to show you an example of how simple it is to find someone. Hopefully this works. Uh, when this video plays, just pay attention to what he says. What's the guy from Los Archie? Welcome back to another late night adventure. Today I am beginning my video inside of a laundry room of an abandoned mansion. So cool, so awesome. I had to come and investigate at nighttime and explore it. I haven't been through the house just yet. I literally just started off here in the laundry room. And uh, this place is abandoned, obviously, but it was owned by somebody really creepy. And I'll tell you guys more about that throughout this place. I've seen photos. It looks absolutely terrifying. Like a bit evil gothic style. I'm pretty sure the person that owned this place was into children at some point. So there's a lot of creepy stuff in here. So let's go and explore. It gets worse. I thought I just heard something. As you guys can see, this place is abandoned, but there is electricity. I cannot wait to tell you guys about the person that used to own this house. <laughs> Pretty creepy looking house, right? Creepy house fitting for a person that was creepy. And then did creepy things to people. And by people, I mean children, which is pretty wild. Now, as you guys can see, there is electricity, which is insane. 
Look at that chandelier. I'm trying to keep my lights low. It is lit up a little bit, um, but you know, we don't want to get caught out here. So it's an abandoned house, obviously. So look at these chandeliers. Wow. This is definitely giving me creepy pedo vibes. <laughs> All right, so this mansion, by the way, it was owned by, I'm not sure if I can say it, it was owned by this Canadian billionaire, and he recently got caught being a pedo on his island, kind of like Epstein-style island. This guy had an island as well, where he was taking children to the island. And this is one of his many homes. We're in a very, very rich area. Like, literally Drake's mansion is just next door, which is absolutely insane. So this was one of his many homes. He was really old. I think he's in jail now. Yeah, this guy's in jail. Pretty crazy. And now we're checking out one of his many abandoned homes. Now, okay. So, so it was abandoned and creepy. Yes, oh, God, and the home of a guy that was a pedophile, and this and that. It's abandoned. It's definitely abandoned. Sure. Pretty much everything he said was wrong. Yeah, everything was false. So I'm, I'll get to this. This guy. He runs a YouTube channel, and he explores abandoned places, and he also says a lot of things are haunted. Um, this is the thumbnail for his video. It says, Haunted Poltergeist House. Um, so I actually saw this based on a video that a friend of mine made. It was a reaction to this guy and basically pointing out everything he did wrong. The only thing my friend said was that he didn't know where the house was, and he couldn't find it. Uh, and I was like, oh. Well, it's like 1.30 in the morning, I'm watching this. I got nothing to do. Um, let me see if I can find it. So I did. I, I found it. Within 20 minutes, I found the house. Um, so I took a screen capture from his video of this kitchen because it's a very unique kitchen. And I did a Google image search. That is it. Came up with this picture, which gave me the address, which I blurred out. Um, gave me the complete address. I knew exactly where it was. So I went, I put that into a Google again, did a search, came up with a story about a, an old family that escaped uh, Germany and came to America, built a house, lived in the house for the last 54 years up until that article was written. So one owner, not a pedophile, not a convicted felon, no, none of this, owned by one person. Um, at the end of that article, I found a picture of an elderly lady in a wheelchair and I did a Google search on that picture, came up with those pictures which you can see is the same kitchen. Mm -hmm. Now I had the owner's name, I had the daughter's name, I had the address, I had how long they had the house for, I had all the personal information. This is all within 20 minutes that I got this. And this is not knowing where in the world this house was, okay? So I wanna stress that point. 20 minutes, I found a house on the planet, which is really cool. Um, and I, to, to wrap up this story, I contacted, I, I found the agent, that was uh, the, the real estate agent that was associated with the house because it is not abandoned, it's vacant. It was recently sold. I contacted the agent, told them what was going on, supplied the video, and they contacted the previous owner and the new owner and charges are filed against yeah. this person. Yeah. Yes, the video was taken down, not before I recorded it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. which I let them know, I let the police know that I have a recording of everything. Um, but yeah, charges are filed, the video is no longer available, and they are in some serious shit, um, which is great. Yeah. All right, visit the location. Uh, whenever you get a chance, I always encourage to visit the location. So this is a real good thing, I think, for your group. When you're down here and you start getting calls or somebody mentions that they have a house or they have a sighting or something like that, get involved. If there's testable claims, which we'll talk about in a second, go out there, visit the location, talk to them. Um, don't make any promises, but just go out and talk. Um, because I, I feel that the boots on ground, the hands-on approach is the best approach because sometimes you get better insight by actually having a scene in front of you where you can walk up, you can change your view, you can touch things, um, just not people, um, you can touch things and really understand what's going on. Um, it can also bring peace of mind to a homeowner. Uh, I've been to many places, and I'm not going to get into it right now because it's way too long, but many places by just showing up, sitting down and listening to them hearing them stories, and then going through the motions by solving it, by going through, like, all right, I think this is what caused your experience, and we do it. And then they're like, oh, all right, that looks like it. Are you satisfied that we solved that mystery? Yes, we move on. And by the time I leave, they feel much better in their own home. Eyewitness testimony sucks. Um, across the board, it sucks. 
I mean, people can remember stuff, but not like a video camera, not a, cam not a, a still camera. They don't record things and know every little detail, no matter what they say. I don't care if they say, I know what I saw. No, you didn't. All right. You might have seen stuff, and you might get most of it right, but you might have missed something. Let's go into it. Let's get into a little bit more detail. A lot of things affect how people remember things. Expectations. I, I've highlighted a few things. Expectations. When I go, people usually mistake me for a ghost hunter, and they try to tell me what I want to know, what they think I want to know, and it's usually not. Um, wakefulness. So many ghost hunters and UFO hunters, they go out, they start their investigations at 10 o'clock at night. That's when most of them go to bed during the week to get up for work. So by 11 or midnight, they're falling asleep. I can't tell you how many times I've caught ghost hunters like doing this. And they're like, oh, that was a ghost. Do you hear that? No, no. Um, I also separate witnesses as soon as possible. If I get on scene, I separate everyone. because I don't want them collaborating stories. I don't want them filling in the blanks of each other. So I separate them, get the stories and the details, and then I compare them later. Testable claims. Um, what is a testable claim? It's something that you can prove or disprove as a result of testing, data collection, or experience. So for me, a good example is a testable claim is when someone says something like, at 1 a.m. every night, uh, I hear footsteps coming down my main stairs. You can test that. You can be there. You can set up cameras, microphones, uh, seismic meters. You can set up all bunch, a whole bunch of stuff and test it. Excuse me. Um, but if you have a not psychic, psychic person yeah. here, and they yeah. say, well, I feel an evil presence here, they don't like skeptics, and they want you to get out or there's going to be trouble. That's not a testable claim, because basically you can leave, nothing happens. But if you say, no, I'm not leaving, nothing happens. <laughs> you know, and they usually say, well, you know, the spirit didn't want to put up with you, so they left. I'm like, good, that means I win. Uh, documentation. Document everything. If you're out on an investigation, take pictures. If you find records, PDFs, uh, photographs that they have, take pictures of them. Take, make copies. Um, print it out. Uh, take a photo with your phone. Make photocopies if you go to historical societies or libraries because, to be truth, truthful, they are often underfunded. So if it costs me a dime per copy, I pay it. All right? But most cases, they let you use your phone. But I document everything. I not only have hard drives and backup drives, um, external drives that I keep in my you know, different desk drawers and at home with backup copies of everything. I have file cabinets. I have physical file cabinets where I have files on everything that I do. Uh, that way I can refer back to it, especially if, I don't know, like the police show up and say, hey, you reported a trespassing. Do you have records? Yes, I do. I have everything. Here you go. You want a copy? <laughs> I'll give it to you. Primary sources. These are a list of primary sources. Um, you want to go with primary sources anytime you can because it's the original source. It's the original place where you got a quote or something happened or somebody reported. You definitely want that because secondary sources are okay, but they're just not as good. Um, and I'd rather say, um, hey, yeah, I got it directly from the witness. I didn't go to the witness's friend of a friend of a friend and they told me what happened because that doesn't mean anything to me. Verify historical claims. That basically means... Make sure the event happened. Uh, so many times I've, I've been told, oh, yeah, this soldier died at this fort. And then I go through the records and realize <laughs> there was no record of that person. They were never stationed there. They didn't exist. Nothing happened. Or somebody that was like 50 years old was actually a child of like several months old. Um, so you have to verify that something actually happened at that site uh, before you go in and do an investigation. I'm sorry. I'm trying to speed up now because I got four and a half minutes or something like that. Uh, good. Uh, experiments. Simple experiments can often give you the most information. And these are some that I've done. This is me taking pictures of Eric behind the wall, Eric, our outreach coordinator, throwing a hubcap so we can make a 1950 style UFO photo, which came out great. Black and white, grainy, looks wonderful. Sun's glinting off it, perfect. Um, this is me pulling table and chairs, a table and chairs with string um, recreating a poltergeist video from 1987 uh, with the same camera. I had a 1987 video VHS camera set up so I could have the same crappy quality uh, video as they did. Uh, this is me. <laughs> this is a late, latest UFO sighting in New York. I was recreating the UFO, which I thought was a balloon. So I had the balloon in the shape that I thought it was tied down to my trash can so it wouldn't fly away. 
because I lost the first one, it flew away. <laughs> um, so that's the second one that I got. Uh, this is me doing a ghost hunting method that was just completely useless. It's listening to a radio and spitting out words and they think that's talking to ghosts. And I did it just so I can tell them, no. <laughs> this is me recreating a, a, a famous ghost photo called the, the falling body photo. Um, and then Teddy Bear, this is a famous ghost photo that I recreated. This is the Brown Lady of Raymond Hall. It's the most famous ghost photo probably ever. And I did it all in film. Um, I recreated it in film, no digital manipulation, nothing like that. I was able to do it. Uh, be nice. Whew, I'm going to make it. Um, last thing is be nice. We're skeptics. We're not assholes, okay? And, and I can't stress that enough. We have to be nice about it. Um, talk to people. If they have an experience, this may be the first time they're coming to you and asking this question. And if you're dismissive about it, that's going to reflect on all of us. All right, so listen to them. If you don't believe it, if you don't want to follow up, be polite and bow out, that's all, or recommend somebody else. But be nice about it. Um, they're going to be more willing to speak with you. I set up conference, uh, uh, I set up booths at conferences that are paranormal themed, UFO themed, Bigfoot themed. I'm going to a Bigfoot conference to speak. They invited me out because I keep a good relationship with them and I don't treat them like crap. Um, I listen to them. Find common ground. You know, find a point that you both agree on and then work from that. Go out from that. And if you start to stray, try to come back to that common point and then work back out again. Uh, don't be dismissive. That's the worst thing we can do. If somebody tells you they had an experience and you just like, whatever, that's stupid. That's the worst thing you can do because they're not going to come back to you. They're going to go tell their friends how horrible you are, how you don't listen to them, and then move on. Um, and then with that, I just want to say I work for CFI. This is my company. I work full time for them. We work on donations from people like you. Just subscribe to Skeptical Inquirer. Helps me do my job and lets me stay employed <laughs> and travel around and talk to groups like this. Uh, and then if there's anything else that you want to see, this is what I do. I do Western New York branch of CFI. I help run that. Um, Skeptical Inquirer magazine. Make sure you subscribe if you're not already uh, because it's a wonderful magazine. We're on 48 years. We're coming up on 50 years in 2026. Which, incidentally, uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to tell you, but our PsyCon will be in Buffalo, New York uh, in 2026. So it'll be on the East Coast. Um, so come out. Uh, and then Ghosts in the Machine is a series I do for the CFI YouTube channel where I get more in depth. Uh, you'll see the UFO uh, balloon trash can thing that I did. <laughs> you'll see the whole video of that. And then every Friday night, except when I'm on here, <laughs> like on vacation or uh, lecturing, I do a live stream show on YouTube and Facebook called The Skeptical Help Bar. You can tune in. And that is my presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Woo! You got it, 10 second. <laughs> 10 seconds. <sighs> Did it. Nice. Breathe. <laughs> oh, we have a question. We got time for two questions. What was that? Oh, that created uh, yeah. Bio. So the. Let's see. I'm guessing steam. What do you think it is, you guys? So, what, yeah, what do you think it is? Aliens. Let me, let me try. Rob threw down his sheets from the balcony, and Susan saw it. I think you saw it, right? You saw it. It landed on the floor. And Susan's idea was to, hey, that would be a ghost. And so Rob did it again, and I missed it. So then, actually, you know what? No, it was. Uh, Coleman, wasn't it your idea about the video? I wasn't even there. No? So we took video of it, and I took a still, a still shot, and that's the still shot. So it creates, it's got blurring. So I'm up at the top throwing the sheet multiple times. Maybe it was Rob that told me to take video. You know, creating. I don't know. I don't know. testimony <laughs> Yeah, see? See? I mean, that's a perfect example. <laughs>